Uh, the title of my paper, How to Behave in the Household of God, Insights from the Early Church. Section 1, Women and the Church. The title of this conference is Exercising Authority, Women and the Church. I'd like to begin by drawing your attention to the conference subtitle, namely, Women and the Church. What are we talking about when we speak of women and the church? Thankfully, I think it's safe to assume that everyone here knows what a woman is. Although, as you know, we live at a time in which knowledge of what a woman is can no longer be taken for granted in the world around us. Not many years ago, who would have thought that there would possibly be a documentary made entitled, What is a Woman?, that would document all sorts of serious adults who would be totally incapable of answering that question. Nevertheless, again, I trust that everyone here knows what a woman is. So let's consider instead the final word of that subtitle, Women and the Church. What is the church? In its basic sense, the word church, Greek ekklesia, simply refers to an assembly or, or a gathering together of people. In the Greco-Roman world of biblical times, for example, the legislative assembly of eligible citizens was an ecclesia, a church in English. Since ecclesia is a general term for an assembly of people, the New Testament writers often make it clear which particular assembly they're talking about. For example, St. Paul writes to the church, ecclesia, that is, assembly, of God that is in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1-2. In other words, Paul makes it clear that he's writing not just to any old assembly, but to the assembly which belongs to God and which is assembled in a particular geographical locale. To summarize, in Christian usage, the word church basically refers to the local gathering of Christians who have assembled for the divine service. And I think I, I shouldn't have put it in a footnote. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning the footnote here that the same idea lies behind our term congregation, right? Um, it, it defines it by the word itself. The congregation is that which congregates. And, and note the definition of the church in the Augsburg Confession. Um, the church is the assembly, the assembly, again, of all believers, among whom the gospel is purely preached, and the holy sacraments are administered according to the gospel. <coughs> Why does this matter? It matters when we return to the conference subtitle, Women and the Church. When we discuss women and the church, we're talking about the place and role of women within a larger assembly of people that consists of many members. Since the church is an assembly, we can ask some of the same questions about it that we might ask of other assemblies. For example, is there any built-in order to the parts of the assembly when they come together? Is there any rhyme or reason to the functioning of its parts? Does it matter how the various parts of the assembly relate to one another or not? As we ponder these questions, it may be helpful to place ourselves outside the Christian context for a moment and consider a different kind of assembly, such as the military. The military has a built-in order that's necessary for its functioning. This is evident from the fact that the Greek word for order, taxis, is originally a military term that means drawing up in rank and file, or battle array, which suggests many elements moving in harmony according to each element's assigned place in the general scheme. The term taxis can be used to refer to the ranking of soldiers in a military hierarchy, but also, and more commonly, concretely to the organization of a unit in battle order around its commander and under its standard. He usually led from the center of front line for battle with his soldiers around him. 
In a military taxis, the success of the unit depends on each soldier staying in his assigned place and doing his job. The orderly ranking and arrangement of the constituent parts do not make for the inferiority or inequality of some parts. Rather, it actually enables the harmonious cooperation of the whole. One of the earliest Christian bishops outside the New Testament, Clement of Rome, elaborates on this point as he reflects on the ordering of the Christian assembly. Quote, so let us serve as soldiers, brothers, with all seriousness under God's faultless orders. Let us consider the soldiers who serve under our commanders, how precisely, how readily, how obediently they execute orders. Not all are prefects or tribunes or centurions or captains of 50 and so forth, but each in his own rank, ento idio tagmati, that's related to that word taxis, order, executes the orders given by the emperor and the commanders. The great cannot exist without the small, nor the small without the great. There is a certain blending in everything, and therein lies the advantage. Let us take our body as an example. The head without the feet is nothing. Likewise, the feet without the head are nothing. Even the smallest parts of our body are necessary and useful to the whole body. Yet all the members coalesce harmoniously and unite in mutual subjection so that the whole body might be saved." Unquote. From these examples, it is clear that the church, like any assembly of various parts, must have an order, a taxis, that allows for its proper functioning. As in the military, not everyone in the church has the same position or role. But these differences do not betray any inequality. Instead, this order provides for the beautiful, complementary functioning of the various parts of the assembly in one harmonious unit. But now we must go a step further. Since the church is an assembly, what can be said about its particular character? What kind of assembly is it? And what does this tell us about its various parts and the way they fit together? To answer these questions, we turn our attention to the language and practice of the earliest Christians, beginning with the New Testament itself. Part 2, The Church as Body and Household. What kind of order or taxis characterizes the Christian assembly? The military is not the only example of taxis in the world. Clement of Rome mentions the order of the human body, but there is also the order of day and night, the arrangement of the stars, the order of the seasons, and more in the natural world. In the New Testament, although military terms are occasionally used in reference to the church, the military order is not played out extensively in relation to the ordering of the Christian assembly. Two other types of orders, however, are prominent. The New Testament writers regularly characterize the taxis of the church by means of two primary images, one, the human body, and two, the household. Let us consider the human body first. The comments of Clement of Rome that we heard above regarding the parts of the human body are no doubt based on St. Paul's language, in particular from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There he writes to the Christians assembled in Corinth, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 27. Not all parts of the body are the same, and not all have the same function. Yet each part and its unique function is necessary for the harmonious functioning of the whole body. Indeed, if the whole body were an eye, 
it would certainly see well, but it would not be able to hear or smell anything. Similarly, if the whole body were an ear, it would certainly hear well, but it would not be able to move or do any work with its hands. In fact, if all members of the body were the same, and all did the same things, there would be no body at all. In his own words, Paul concludes, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The example of the human body demonstrates that an orderly hierarchy of parts and differences of function do not betray any ontological inferiority or inequality. The head, for example, sits in a position of authority on the top of the body and is given the function of governing the rest of the body. But even so, the head is merely one part of the body, and the other parts of the body are nothing other than parts of the same body. There is an obvious ontological identity among all its, all its parts. Yet this ontological identity exists within a taxis, an order, in which the parts are arranged in a particular way with unique functions. The fact that the hand cannot see doesn't make it inferior to the eye, just as the eye's inability to grasp anything doesn't make it inferior to the hand. This observation should help us understand that when we speak of different roles for men and women within the Christian assembly, our minds should not immediately jump to, to notions of inequality. For example, the notion that a prohibition against women reading the scripture lessons within the Christian assembly betrays women's inferiority makes as little sense as the notion that the ear's inability to grasp anything makes it inferior to the hand. To take the example one notch further, it would make little sense to say that in the name of equality between your feet and your eyes, your feet will now be given the ability to see. In reality, the ability to see wouldn't make your feet equal to your eyes, it would simply make them identical with your eyes. So the equality of all the parts of the body is preserved, not by every part doing the same things, but by each part doing very well the things that it is uniquely suited to do. If we forget this, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that men and women can be made quote-unquote equal, by ensuring that women do all the things that men do. But rather than elevating women and making them equal to men, such think thinking practically threatens to turn women into men and undermine any unique gifts that God has given to women <laughs> as women. In the interest of time, let's move on to the other primary New Testament image for the Christian church, namely the household of God. Here we turn again to St. Paul, who writes to Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. Here, the Christian assembly is simply equated with God's household. In another place, Paul addresses members of the church in Ephesus, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Indeed, the language of the church as God's household is such a pervasive feature of early Christian vocabulary that it is simply assumed in the New Testament and rarely explained in detail. St. Paul writes to the Galatians, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6.10 when Paul gives instructions to Titus 
about the sort of men he should be appointing as elders, that is, pastors, in each town. He says that an overseer, bishop, that is, pastor, as God's steward, must be above reproach. The word steward here is oikonomon in the Greek, literally meaning a household manager. That is to say, in the church, God is the father of the household, but he appoints men as pastors to be his household managers. In 1 Timothy, Paul draws out these implications even more explicitly. The correlation between the earthly household and the Christian assembly as God's household lies behind his insistence that an overseer, again, bishop or pastor, must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? The correspondence is clear. A man who does not manage his earthly household well cannot be expected to have better luck when it comes to managing God's household, the church. St. Paul is not the only New Testament writer to speak in these terms. St. Peter writes in his first epistle, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, meaning the church. Moreover, the explicit language of the church as household only scratches the surface of the New Testament's witness to this reality. Consider the fact that early Christians consistently thought of and referred to one another as brothers and sisters. This language is no mere metaphor. It is not simply a nice way of saying that we all get along. For early Christians, to call someone a brother or sister was a way of identifying them as a fellow member of the household of God. It was a confession that through holy baptism, God has become our Father. Since in baptism we have put on Christ, we are now identified with him as sons of God, and therefore we are truly brothers and sisters in relation to one another with God as our common Father. The reality of household relationships even defines the way that St. Paul instructs Christians to relate to one another within the assembly. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2. Ultimately, early Christians learned this way of speaking and thinking about one another from Jesus himself, who in more than one place states that the deepest reality of household relationships is found in the church, the community of his disciples. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus stretches out his hand toward his disciples and proclaims, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. As Christians today, we are certainly familiar with this biblical language of the church as God's household. But how often do we stop to consider deeply what it means? How often do we consider that when we come to church, that is, when we gather with the Christian assembly in a given place, we are in fact gathering as the household of God, in which we relate to God as Father, to the pastor as his representative household steward, and to one another as brothers and sisters. Allow me to suggest that at a time when many earthly households are struggling to find the cohesion and order that allows them to function well as a household, and at a time when the very reality of men and women, and therefore brothers and sisters, is under attack, our congregations would do well 
to take this biblical language for the church very seriously. What does it mean, concretely, to assemble as God's household? As we have heard above, St. Paul assumes that there is a particular way in which one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. What then is this way? Part three, concrete examples in the New Testament. We will seek to answer this question by way of a brief survey of the relevant New Testament data before attempting to draw a few conclusions. We turn first to 1 Timothy, the letter in which St. Paul speaks explicitly of the way one ought to behave in the household of God. In chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy that he hopes to come to him soon in person. However, in case he is delayed, he is writing these things to Timothy so that he may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, even if he isn't there to deliver these instructions personally. When he says he is writing these things about behavior in the household of God, he's referring back to what he has just written, the block of text beginning with 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, and going through 3, 13. Paul has spent the last chapter and a half laying down specific instructions to the different members of God's household. He begins with instructions for the men. Quote, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. 1 Timothy 2.8 This is how the men ought to behave in the household of God. The section concludes with standard expectations for the behavior of bishops and deacons in God's household, 1 Timothy 3, 1-13. In between come the instructions for the women. Quote, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. 1 Timothy 2, 9-15 through In Paul's view, this is how women ought to behave in the household of God. It may be helpful to attempt a summary at this point. Three main patterns of behavior emerge for women in God's household. One, they are to adorn and decorate themselves with modesty and good works, rather than costly clothing, jewelry, and cosmetics. Two, they are to remain quiet within the Christian assembly, an instruction that clearly does not prohibit women from singing hymns or congregational responses, but specifically from taking a position of leadership within the assembly, such as reading the scriptures, preaching, and the like. And three, the bearing and rearing of children is mentioned as the woman's particular glory, here somewhat cryptically as the means of woman's salvation. <clears throat> These three patterns of behavior seem to provide the basic New Testament understanding of the place of women within the order or taxis of God's household. Indeed, these three patterns of behavior show up with remarkable consistency throughout the New Testament epistles, even if all three features do not always appear together. For example, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul again instructs that the women should keep silent in the churches, that is, assemblies, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. Unsurprisingly, 
This instruction is part of Paul's larger concern that everything in the assembly be done, quote, decently and in order, kata taxin. Several parallel passages speak more directly to women's behavior in the domestic sphere, but contain nearly identical instructions. For example, to summarize Paul's instructions in Titus, older women are to be reverent in behavior, teaching and training younger women in what is good, that is, to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, working at home, and submissive to their own husbands. See Titus 2, 3 through 5. Even if these instructions pertain especially to home life, Paul certainly envisions a context, perhaps very naturally the Christian assembly, in which this godly training of younger women by older women would regularly take place. Similarly, St. Peter instructs wives to be subject to their own husbands, and to let their adorning be the imperishable beauty of good works and quiet submission to their husbands, <coughs> rather than flashy clothing and jewelry. Again, in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, wives are instructed to submit to their own husbands as to the Lord, in imitation of the church's submission in everything to Christ, its head. In Colossians 3:18. The only specific instruction given to women is, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It is apparent that such instructions were extremely common features of apostolic catechesis when it was directed specifically to women. Part 4. Concrete Examples in the Post-Apostolic Church in the concluding portion of my paper, I'd like to explore how the identity of the church as God's household persisted in the consciousness and practice of the church of the first few centuries, and what insights we may be able to draw for today. A brief survey of evidence from early church orders, liturgies, and other writings makes one thing clear. If our culture is having a difficult time distinguishing between men and women, the church of the first few centuries, with its conviction that it gathered as God's household, had no such difficulties. Indeed, the harmonious distinctiveness of men and women was practically reinforced week after week in the assembly, not only by way of teaching, but also in the concrete practices of the church. One early church order, the Didascalia Apostolorum, provides an extended example. It begins by identifying the members of the church as those who have received boldness to call the Almighty God Father, and thus as children of God. The next two chapters give unique instructions to men and then to women about how they ought to behave. The reality of the church as household and body is implicit in that the instructions to women address them as, quote, our sisters and our daughters and our members, unquote. Expectations follow for the men that are appointed as bishops or heads in every assembly. Household language is ubiquitous here. The bishop is, quote, your father after God. He, quote, rules in the place of the Almighty, unquote, and is to be, quote, honored by you as God, unquote. Each layman is to reflect on whether he loves other laymen and also whether he loves the bishop and honors and fears him as Father and Lord, while the bishop is likewise asked whether he loves the laity as his children and cherishes and keeps them warm with loving care as eggs from which young birds are to come, by way of teaching and admonishing, and when necessary, rebuke. There is an explicit reference to the household passage of 1 Timothy 3, quote, For if his, that is the bishop's, household in the flesh withstand him and obey him not, 
how, this is a typo, how shall they that are without his house become his and be subject to him, unquote. Again, we see that the bishop's management of his household in the flesh is considered a prerequisite to his management of its corollary, the household of God, or perhaps implicitly, the household of the Spirit. Yet the taxis of the church extends far beyond the bishop. The deacon is understood to stand in the place of Christ, while, interestingly, the deaconess is to be honored by you in the place of the Holy Spirit. The presbyters are in the likeness of the apostles, and even orphans and widows have their place in the taxis. They are to be reckoned by you in the likeness of the altar. When the Didascalia describes the concrete reality of the worshiping assembly, it uses the language of Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, commanding that the assemblies be held with all decent order. What does this mean? In the Didascalia, this means, first of all, that the brethren have appointed places to sit within the assembly. The presbyters sit together with the bishop in their midst, and the laymen sit in another part of the house, and the women sit in still another part. Furthermore, the young sit apart or stand if there is no room, and those advanced in years also sit apart. Why? The Lord likened the church to a fold, and oxen, sheep, and goats lie down and rise up and feed according to their families, and none of them separate itself from its kind." Unquote. The arrangement of men and women in their own places was a common feature of early Christian assemblies. As a matter of fact, there are members at my congregation in Minnesota who recall such a seating arrangement within their lifetimes. However, in the early church, this arrangement not only reflected the order of a household, but it also enabled the sharing of the holy kiss in a respectable manner, removing any possibility of the kiss presenting an opportunity for sexual gratification rather than being a holy kiss shared among the members of the Christian household. Although the holy kiss or the kiss of peace has fallen out of practice today, it was a regular feature of early Eucharistic liturgies, being mentioned in the New Testament no fewer than five times. Another early church order, the apostolic tradition ascribed to Hippolytus, offers a representative example of instructions regarding this kiss. Quote, Whenever the teacher ceases to give instruction, the catechumens should pray by themselves, separated from the faithful, and the women should stand and pray by themselves. The faithful should greet one another, the men with each other, and the women with each other. They kiss each other on the mouth." Unquote. Early Christian texts also frequently repeat the biblical injunction requiring silence of women in the worshiping assembly. But it must be stressed again that such injunctions in no way reflect an attitude of inferiority regarding women. This was simply the good order by which the church, as a body and as the household of God, would function well. Women did not need to speak in the church in order to have an irreplaceable position within the Christian assembly. Many other avenues of service within the household were available to women in particular ones that contributed to her fulfillment of the Pauline exhortation to be adorned with good works. Christian women were very active in honoring widows, visiting the sick, attending to the needy, caring for prisoners, man managing their households as centers of productivity, and more. Indeed, the Didascalia finds such works of mercy rooted in the example of women in the Gospels. Quote, For our Lord and Savior also was ministered unto by women ministers, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the daughter of James, and mother of Jose, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee, with other women beside. 
and thou also hast need of the ministry of a deaconess for many things. For a deaconess is required to go into the houses of the heathen, where there are believing women, and to visit those who are sick, and to minister to them in that of which they have need, and to bathe those who have begun to recover from sickness." Unquote. I would like to suggest that these patterns of behavior indicate that, returning to the image of the body, women's place in the taxis was simply understood to be more akin to the womb and the hands rather than the head. Women in the church had the role of nourishing the life that was born in the church and strengthening the bonds of love therein by their dedication to works of mercy. These works of mercy naturally found their most basic expression within the home by honor for the husband and love for the children, but they extended from there to all those in need, especially in places where men were not able to go. It is true that the head is responsible for governing and speaking for the body, and women are not given this place within the taxis. But if the life begotten in the church were not nourished within the matrix of woman's loving self-giving, the head would have no body to lead and no body for which it might speak. Perhaps it is no surprise, then, that the Didascalia also speaks of the church in glowing terms as the bride adorned for the Lord God, and as your mother, the church, the living and life-giving. In this connection, it is noteworthy that with overwhelming regularity, admonition to proper behavior precisely as husbands and fathers, or wives and mothers, forms the basic catechesis offered to men and women by the apostles and early church orders in the subsequent centuries. Clearly, for the apostles and those after them, marriage and childbearing was the basic context in which the vast majority of Christians were expected to participate in the church's life and learn to take up their crosses and follow Jesus. In view of this, might it not be the case that for both men and women, the most pressing question may not be what kind of position they may attain in the church, but first, how they are receiving the apostolic catechesis related to family life. It is surely significant that, as we have seen, the Apostle Paul considers the good management of a household to be a prerequisite to the bestowal of the management of God's church upon a father. Less well-known, perhaps, is Paul's requirement in the same letter that those who are officially enrolled as widows in the church have previously given evidence of their faith within the domestic realm. The only widow to be enrolled is one who, among other things, has been the wife of one husband, and has a reputation for good works, has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the feet of the saints, cared for the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. What of the younger widows who are still of childbearing age? Paul writes, I would have the younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. 1 Timothy 5.14 Might we even go so far as to say that these persistent apostolic instructions regarding a woman's respect for her husband, her care and nurture of children, and her management of the home constitute, at least to the greatest degree possible, her unique place within the taxis of God's household. With this question, we may recall the earlier observation that the quest to make women do everything that men do has a tendency practically to turn women into men and erase the unique distinctiveness that God has given to women. Abigail Favale, a contemporary Roman Catholic scholar on gender issues, makes a similar point in a provocative essay entitled Rethinking Women's Reproductive Health. She writes, quote, My main contention is this. What is often presented as women's reproductive health 
actually pathologizes natural biological realities that are unique to women, namely fertility, pregnancy, and childbirth. There is an underlying hidden premise at work in this paradigm of pathology, which prevails in both feminist rhetoric and the medical establishment. Women, to be healthy and free, must function, biologically speaking, as much like men as possible. What is uniquely female, then, is pathologized, seen as a condition that needs to be treated, a problem that needs to be solved." Unquote. I would like to suggest that in the New Testament, the features that Favale identifies as uniquely female, the capacity for fertility and childbirth, far from being pathologized, are glorified and elevated, being filled with theological significance. Indeed, the scriptures make it clear that the marriage between Christ and the church is what we might call ultimate reality. Yet God has graciously given us concrete means by which ultimate reality may be manifested to us on earth, however dimly. And no means is more potent in this regard than that of married life. If the ultimate reality is the church's life-giving submission to Christ, her bridegroom, women have the unique capability to manifest this reality to the Christian assembly through their humble submission to their own husbands on earth. Indeed, just as a man is uniquely capable of manifesting God the Father and the man Christ Jesus to the Christian assembly in his own concrete maleness, so also a woman is uniquely capable of manifesting the submissive but life-giving receptivity of the church, understood as bride and mother, to the Christian assembly in her own concrete femaleness. Far from demonstrating her inequality and inferiority, then, <laughs> woman's capacity to conceive and bear life within her own body is her particular glory. And a true glory it is. Children are of much more value than worldly business and bank accounts. They are, as St. John Chrysostom says, our principal wealth. On this point, we conclude with the candid remarks of Alice von Hildebrand, given in an interview near the end of her life in 2022. When the interviewer asked, so is feminism a rejection of yourself as a woman? Von Hildebrand responded, quote, no, it is a systematic rejection or refusal to understand what is a woman's mission. You can say that to be a male is an honor and to be a female is not. They're not understanding that to conceive and to give birth to a child is something infinitely more important. Don't forget that all accomplishments of men will be destroyed at the end of time. Everything will be burned, but every woman who has given birth to a child came to eternity. And therefore today, in my feeling, what is most important is for women to rediscover the beauty and greatness of their mission. I'm proud to be a woman. I have not chosen it, but I'm proud to be. I beg God every day, give me the grace to live up to my dignity as a woman." Unquote. To Christ be all the glory now and forever. Please. Yeah. As an elderly woman, older, not elderly, <laughs> our congregation, um, I found that it's very difficult to help younger people, um, younger women, understand what this means, especially in, well, I'm a seamstress and I, their dress and yeah. the immodesty with which some of them, the, the clothing they pick is not appropriate for church. I don't care what they wear somewhere else, but <laughs> I don't know, actually I do. I, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. I don't know how to present that in a way that they don't say, you will bang. You know, I don't know how to be the person that I feel I should be in modeling that. Mm. Yeah. 
Thank you. Question. Yeah, good. Okay. Why do I do that? Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good. Yeah, so a question uh, from an older woman in a congregation. <laughs> Not elderly, but yeah. yeah. You're um, supposed to say experienced. Oh. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, yeah, how, how do our older women, let's say, in our congregations go about doing the sorts of things that St. Paul uh, recommends, even commands that they do, um, the specific example or the sp specific question related to the the dress of younger women in the church that perhaps is uh, is immodest and um, and things along those lines. How how do we actually go about that that sort of teaching that Paul um, mentions uh, in Titus? Right. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah. It's not, so I I'm afraid I don't know if I have great answers. <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, I've, as I was writing this, this essay, I was talking to my wife about it too, um, who's, you know, about my age, but we're right. just trying to think about in our congregation, what are the, what are the actual avenues by which the sort of things that St. Paul mentions uh, as what older women should be doing in a congregation, do we actually have any sort of context in which those things can happen? I mean, or if we do, um, how how is it received? Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, I, I'll, let me say this uh, for my own wife. Um, I know one of the things for her, and I don't mean she was never like immodest or something by any means. But I will say that in her experience, um, and and she especially experienced this in college at one of our Concordias, um, which I'm very thankful for. She. Um, She's told me many times that that her um, her experiences with the pastor's family in college uh, and with some of the professors in college who had families that would invite the students over for um, for Easter or something if if they couldn't go home, right? Um, some of those some of those uh, experiences were for her probably the most formative. Um, and thought-provoking ways that this sort of teaching happened, where it wasn't like a, it wasn't like okay, we're going to have a Bible class where you know, our our older ladies are going to you know teach uh, teach all of this by by a handout or something, right? Yeah, but simply by uh, by first and foremost by by living and modeling that yourself, right? That certainly was um, was very formative for my wife as someone. Um, who, who received that from some older women, and I and I should say too, not always older women. Um, I, it's dangerous to speak this way, right? Yeah, but but like mothers, um, mothers who are older than my wife was, but are actively mothers of their children. That seeing the way that they acted in their households, that they acted in church and with their families and such, was also very formative for for my wife. Right. So I think perhaps that's. Um, Perhaps that's the the fundamental thing. Just keep doing it, huh? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. You can never control how somebody's going to receive it, but you can control your attitude, the way you present yourself, um, your example, right? And God willing, that will be will be received and and probably will have an impact on on younger folks um that you might not see even right now or for a while, but it will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, thanks for your paper. So, um, what is a deaconess? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. The question is, what is a deaconess? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I mean, in all seriousness, like, uh, there's, there's clearly something going on in the early church that, yep. um, is, this is not going on today, at least not, um, not formally. Right. So yeah. what a deaconess is today is something distinct. It's clearly not the exact same thing. No, there might be components that there's some overlap. Yeah. Be, you know, yeah. Similar, but it, it just isn't. So how could you yeah. talk about that? Maybe? Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. So the question, what is a deaconess? And then um thinking about what was a deaconess say in uh the, the text that we read in this paper, is that different or similar to today's deaconess and so forth? Right. Next question. 
Yeah, no, I, I think it is a great, it is a very good question. Yeah. So, I mean, at a, at a basic level, a deaconess is, um, is a female servant, right? So we, we mentioned deacons, which clearly come to have a, a certain official role uh, already in the New Testament. We read some of those passages here where deacons are identified as an order in the church. Um, but the word simply means a servant, right? So a deaconess is uh, a female servant. And I think, yeah, you're right. There's there's clearly something going on um, in the early church. Um, I'm not. I'm certainly not an expert on on this. It, from some of the reading I did in preparing for this too, it seems that there's there, especially in the Eastern Church, in the early church, and that's where the Didascalia, for example, is coming from. Probably Syria. It seems that there's a um, a more involved uh, deaconess kind of position in that Eastern part of the church than even the Western Church at that time. But you get a good sense, at least, uh, maybe I, I just want to look again at some of the things that Didascalia mentions, right? I think these are, um, if, if the question is, what was a deaconess to the author of the Didascalia, right? It has to do a lot with um, these works of mercy for the members of the body of Christ or the members of the household that um, can be nourished by the women, and especially especially like in places that the men were not able to go, like into the house of an unbeliever, where there are, are women there. Uh, the women believers under a, uh, an unbelieving man's household or something, uh, a Christian man just is not going to be able to get there to minister to that woman. But another a woman may be able to encourage them with the word of God or something, right, in that context. Taking care of the sick, these sort of things. Um, I will say it didn't get into my paper too, and I'm I hope I don't misrepresent the Didascalia. But in other places in the Didascalia, it does make clear that even for the deaconesses, um, they were not permitted to baptize. Right? Mm. So there's there's a clear role for the deaconess um, in the Didascalia, but it's not a liturgical role. She may have some. Um, she may have some. Uh, assisting sort of functions, especially in places where um, <laughs> where baptism was done in the nude, uh, um, and women were necessary then to um, to assist in the baptism. It still would have been the the bishop actually administering the word in the water, but a woman kind of assisting with a screen or other aspects of that. Um, so there are kind of auxiliary. Uh, shall we say auxiliary liturgical roles in in that sense um never never kind of in place of the pastor and they made a, a, a very clear distinction there that like women aren't to baptize in the didascalia Just yeah follow up on that i mean mm -hmm. there's no sense that uh, a woman would have chosen this as some sort of a a profession in in order to you know basically choose to be a deaconess in such a way so as to not be at home with her with their children, right? And that's clearly not what's going on here. It's, it, it, isn't it kind of implied that this is um, um, you know, done but even by older women potentially, or like who's actually who's actually who are these deaconesses? Yeah, become deaconesses? And was, maybe that's not in there. But. Yeah, yeah. So I guess let's see. The question was, um, or an observation at least that. These deaconesses, say in the Didascalia, are are clearly not are are not choosing like the deaconess profession as something that's taking them out of their home and they're not taking care of their children anymore or something like that. Right. Yeah, I think that's certainly true, no doubt. I'm I'm not totally clear. I don't think the Didascalia is entirely clear on um let's say like what the age of, of your average deaconess is or um clearly they also have widows, right? Widows are enrolled in the Didascalia, as well as the New Testament. So I would assume, based on that, I would assume that the deaconesses were mostly perhaps younger, but certainly, and and this, I guess this is kind of the main contention of, of my paper that I would like to get across, is that all of, yeah, all of these other works, like including the work of the bishop, right? <laughs> the, the father um, does not replace what he's doing in his home. And so the same would be true for 
a, a deaconess or whatever other forms of service, but beginning with a, with with a bishop himself, it's expected that he's managing his own household well, and thus caring for the Church of God as well. Um, but those things are never pitted against each other. One's never chosen in favor of the other. In fact, I think that's why um, it was interesting to me pulling pulling some of the data together from the New Testament, just how much overlap there is between um, the instructions given to men and women within the church and in the household. There's really no difference. <laughs> it's all the same uh, instructions. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Very quickly. It's fair to say that uh, that husbands have, are, are essentially the manager of the home, but women have, the, the mothers have the responsibility of management of the home, especially in the absence of, I mean, when, I mean, in the absence of the father, I mean, is that, is that, is that, is that <laughs> what's that? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's simple. Try to rephrase. Yeah. yeah. Is it fair to say that the father is what the manager of, of the home, right. but the wife is also well, the, the wife is involved in kind of the daily management of it. Involved you know, in the I daily. See, yeah. I mean, men, mention of that. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Management of the home. So, I mean, kind of, is that, I mean, as the help. Man, right. So, of her husband, husband, right. Yep. Yeah. And I think so. This is a good point. And I think that that has to do also right. with the question earlier regarding the relationship between a husband and wife <laughs> and how that's different than a relationship between children and parents. Right. So clearly. There is there is a relationship of submission of the wife to the husband. I'm thinking of Ephesians five and six. Right. Uh, but children are to obey their parents in the Lord. Obey in that case, and um, and there it's the parents together. And in in a couple of the the passages in from that I mentioned in the paper, um, like in Titus chapter two, women are clearly. Um, the, the older women are to teach the younger women how to uh, work at home. Right. So clearly there's some work going on, right? <laughs> and later on also um, in First Timothy 5, I happen to be on it, um, they're to teach the younger widows to, or Paul would have the younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, right? So certainly, yeah, there's a very active management of the household that's entrusted to the wife and mother. Um, not over against the father, but as his helper. Right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.